Well, Lance, every Thursday before home games and some bonus road games like today, we have the pleasure of talking to Giants great and Super Bowl champion Phil Sims as part of the Sims Spotlight, which is brought to you by Bigelow T. T. Proudly. Mr. Sims, welcome back to the show, sir. How are you? Well, I'm doing well. Good to be back on and everything. And, yes, the Giants going down to Dallas to that beautiful, beautiful stadium they have down there. And, um, well, their team's not playing beautiful, that's for sure. <laughs> so this is going to be an interesting game just to see what happens for all that we've seen so far this year. And, of course, you can see Phil on CBS and a Giants-Cowboys game on CBS, which is like just bizarre yeah. world. We, we never get to see that, Phil. Uh, well, you know what? It's the first one since. 1993 when we played the Cowboys. Uh, Well, yeah, when we played the Cowboys the last game of the year. I was just told that, so I thought, oh, that's a pretty good little thing. So That was the Emmitt Smith separated shoulder game, right, if I'm not mistaken? Is that right? Yes, it was. It's a game we should have won. That's all I know. All right. That Cowboy team was great. I'm not going to admit it, uh, you know, lie. They were really, really good. And it was one of the proudest moments I had, the fact that we took that team in overtime. But let's move on to what's going on now. Yes, absolutely, Phil. So you've watched the tape, the Giants offense. They've played some good defenses. Nevertheless, three touchdowns in four games, no touchdowns the last two weeks. Big picture, what's wrong with this offense right now? Well, l- listen, many things, I guess. I will say this. After the initial onslaught by the Rams defense, which is fast, and we know they got Aaron Donald and they got some – they, they were kind of overrunning the Giants' offensive line. But as the game settled down, I thought the Giants' offensive line really did a good job against that defensive front. So that was a real positive. What is wrong? Well, you need guys to make big plays. You can't always dial up and be creative and say, we're going to get you wide open for the touchdown. Somebody's got to make plays. We're not seeing that enough from the wide receivers. Uh, but really, too, Go on the opposite side, which I see in many teams. Let's take the Cincinnati Bengals. Do you think before the season they were any good? The answer is no. We thought maybe they were probably the worst team in football, but their offense, when I watch it with a rookie quarterback and what we considered a bad offensive line, they do everything. It is like what's coming next. And it, it, it's even though they're outmanned a lot of times, they do it with uh, the plan. And I think when I look at the Giants, I, I just think you've got to put the players in better positions a little more. So Jason Garrett's just got to go, hey, I know we're young. It's the first year in the system. But go ahead and start giving formations, movement, plays, whatever, and be aggressive and do it that way. I think that will really help the offense. Phil, related to the subject that you just hit on in terms of separation by the receivers, as we're also mixing in Twitter questions, and this comes from at Sal from Yonkers. He writes, I notice Daniel Jones stares down a receiver too often, maybe the number one target. How can he and the coaching staff work on that and correct that? Well, you know, I, I kind of thought this question might come up, and I've watched the tapes, and I've never sit there and go, oh, he's looking at the receiver too long. I think he sits in the pocket. He's trying to feel the rush. Uh, you know, he's, he's been a very accurate thrower really all year long. Uh, so I don't see that as something, you know, I, I'm not getting on the question, but it's a little, a little bit of a cliche. Oh, he's staring the receiver down too long. No, I think when they come open, he's hitting them right on stride. <clears throat> Excuse me. He made some terrific throws in the game uh, against the Rams. The Rams were very aggressive. But uh, I do not look at that as one of the problems. Uh, I think I've kind of addressed what I think that you just sometimes – you just got to uh, go for it, have plans that are really, truly creative and all those things, especially in today's game where you can create formations and pick and screen and do things like you've never done before. And we're seeing it with a lot of teams, and I think the Giants need to do more of it. All right, Phil, like one other Daniel Jones questions here. How much do you think his lack of production this year has to do with him trying to figure out a new system? And in addition to, to the lack of touchdowns and production, uh, the turnovers have been a constant problem since he got into the league. So if you can kind of relate those two things together a little bit, how he cleans up the turnovers and, and the factor the new system might be playing in that. Well, having a new system definitely is a drawback a little bit. You know, you've, you've heard it a thousand times about the offseason, didn't get to work with the new system, the wording, the players, all that. Uh, you know, the uh, you know scoring in the – what was the other qu- second part? The turnovers. In the red zone? Yeah, the turnovers, turnover issues. Well, oh, yeah, well, the turnovers <laughs> – well, I lived through those days, trust me. 
And there, there became a time, and I'm going to say it was 1989, not real sure, just said, you know what, no matter what I do today, I am not going to turn it over. And that's a terrible way to play, but sometimes you have to do, just think that way and learn, and that becomes part of you if you do it for a few games. And I went quite a few games, I'd turn it over, and I knew it was a problem because the first question out of every reporter's mouth when the game was over, <laughs> well, Phil, you didn't turn the ball over today. <laughs> well, that's great. Thank you, guys. You know, yeah. But it, it really does have to become a little bit of a conscious effort. And, um, you know, it's a lot of feel to it, knowing when to move, keeping two hands on the football, and just being a quick decision maker. And if it's not there right away, I would complain about this. If it's not there right away, find the outlet receiver. If it's not there, yeah. then, man, I've said it many times, run. I do not think still to this day he runs enough because he, he can be a terrific runner. And, uh, you know, you don't have to run four or five. He can, he can run. He's fast and use his legs more to get himself out of trouble and to really to help his offensive line even more, who I thought played one of their better games against the Rams. I thought after that initial onslaught, they, yeah. they buckled up and, and played tough and, and uh, did a really good job. So that, w- that would be my answer to that. Especially based on how effectively they ran the football in the second half, Phil. There's no doubt about that. And the well, turnovers, the, the, you can let argue. Let me interrupt you real quick. I did sure. love the fact, the way that the running backs just smashed it in there. The, you know, Devontae Freeman, I saw him as a rookie. I was like, oh, my gosh, how long is he going to last? Because he was on. <laughs> but, but I do like that. You know, and I used to say this to an announcer, and people would make fun of me. A two-yard run sometimes is really important on first down. Because it still gives you the opportunity to do kind of what you want on second down and the thing, uh, things like that. So, you know, I, I hate the term situational football, but I did like the way the running backs really were aggressive and tried to be powerful and, and help the offensive line. Well, Phil, I think that's a great point because if you look at the second half, the third down and distances that the Giants faced was much more reasonable and manageable compared to where they were in the first half because of your point, that they ran the ball effectively on first and second down. And that brings me to red zone issues, which you had alluded to earlier, and we have a question on that subject, because the Giants have had 10 opportunities in the red zone. They've only scored touchdowns two times, so they're dead last in that category, and that's a big reason why they're clearly struggling to score. Outside of protecting the football, Phil, what else do you think needs to be done for them to fix these red zone issues? Well, I can only go on by what I was taught as a player many ways, and I see many teams do it. And, you know, if you watch Tampa Bay with Tom Brady or watch New England, they have one glaring uh, stat that tells me what they're going to do. When they get about to the 30-yard line or just inside of it, they're going to try to score. They're going to call plays to go to the end zone to try to score because we know the shorter the field is, the better the defense can get in covering and things like that. The other thing is, too, Andy Reid, just go back to this. And not, I'm not saying you become, they're not going to be the Kansas City offense, but he never just lines up inside the 10 or whatever and just runs almost like I would say normal NFL plays. There's always mm-hmm. a little bit of a trick to it. Like this past week, the shovel passes, whatever it is. Like the Super Bowl, they're down there, big moment. They do the four top uh, shuffle, they all spin and turn. And what did they do? Nothing, but it makes the defense go, well, what's going on? And that little hesitation is the difference. And so me, in the red zone, more than any place at any time of the game, you have to have a different set of plays that the defense is not ready for, and you catch them because they have to think, or you just put a formation or a movement out there that they just not gonna, cannot handle because of what they're doing. And, and the best at it, without question, is Andy Reid. But as I watch all these offenses around the league, all the good red zone teams have one thing in common. Yeah, they can run the ball a little bit when they need to, but they're truly extremely creative when it comes to throwing the football. We're joined by Phil Sims in the Sims Spotlight, brought to you by Bigelow TT Proudly. We thank at Sal from Yonkers, at the August 9, and at Justin Stewart XO for their Twitter questions. Phil, one last one on the Giants specifically before we talk about the matchup against the Cowboys this week. I thought the Giants' defense took some major strides against the Rams, and, and I thought they Big really— time. And I, I, and I think they changed their approach. I think you saw a lot of two safeties deep. You didn't see quite as much of that cover one single high. It was more of a conservative approach. They kept everything in front of them. They tackled. They only allowed one play of 20-plus yards, no yards after the catch. What did you think of the defense? 
I, I really thought it was, a, like you said, major stride. Listen, when you have, in an endearing term, when you have all those hogs up front, which they have, and, you know, I thought Dexter Lawrence and Dalvin Tomlinson, just to name a couple, were really good in the football game. I mean, I kept watching Dexter Lawrence and going, yep. he, you know, playing defensive tackle in the NFL, Bill Parcells told me besides play, being a quarterback, it might be the toughest position to adjust to because in college, the, the, the offenses are not sophisticated. And a defensive lineman, man, they're coming from you, hitting you everywhere, and it takes a while to adjust. I see that. I, I like the fact if you've got a big defensive front, then you should be able to sit back like they did a little bit against the Rams, who do a ton of misdirection and try to fool you with their looks and the boots and all this. And I thought they did a terrific job. I thought they played, I, I, I'm going to say it, they played hard. But we, as fans and even a coach, you expect that every single week to play hard. That shouldn't be you know, something we pat them on the back for. But I thought it was smart. They made it. One mistake that probably cost them the game. Yep. But overall, the tackling. See, even in that, what you're just saying, the way they play it, will make you a better tackling team because you have more eyes on the football. And when you do that, you can rally faster, more people around it. And if you do miss the tackle, there's always somebody there to clean it up. Phil, as we look ahead to the Cowboys matchup this week, it's quite interesting because you really have – two facets on the opposite ends of the spectrum. You have the Giants who have struggled to score. You have the Cowboys who have struggled to make stops. But I think (laughs) when you look at what the Cowboys have been plagued by, it's been turnovers in terms of being minus seven in turnover differential and opponents have capitalized off of great field position. What do you think of this matchup for the Giants offensively to maybe start clicking, despite the fact that many teams haven't had to put together lengthy drives against this Cowboys defense? Well, it's really amazing. I watch the Cowboys every game this year, uh, you know, on both sides. I don't even know where to begin. Last (laughs) week, their run defense was truly, maybe, honestly, the worst I've ever seen in the NFL. It it was Now, I know Cleveland, they have a good offensive line. They have a group, maybe one of the, unfortunately got hurt, Nick Chubb. The running backs are terrific, and they ran the ball. Sometimes they ran the ball 18, 19, 20 yards before the first defender even touched them, which is, you know, it was crazy just to watch it. And it wasn't like it was deception. They lined up and said, here it comes, and the Cowboys could do nothing with it. So, of course, they're going to try to fix some of those things, but I would hope, you know, you can't fix all that in one week. And I would think the Giants, just a little bit I saw last week, I thought the offensive line showed really good toughness against the Rams. If they do that same thing, go out there and fight them, I think they can run the football. And the Cowboys are struggling in the secondary big time. So Daniel Jones, if they run the ball somewhat well, should have some success throwing the football down the field. And then, Phil, on the other side, the Cowboys offense right near the top of the league. I've gone through a couple of their games. I wonder how much the score and situation has maybe inflated some of those offensive stats a little bit where they have to throw in the second half because they're down so many scores. Maybe the defense is playing a little bit soft against them. So how do you view the Cowboys' overall numbers on offense? And obviously all those throws have turned into a lot of turnovers, nine, which is tied for the most in the league. When you see this Cowboys' offense on tape, what do you see? Well, to say the numbers are inflated is an understatement. Um, You know, I just – I didn't do a quick – study of it, but I know they had three long drives at the end of the game where they were throwing it short and running for 10 yards because Cleveland yep. went in too much of a you know, prevent defense or whatever you want to say, or just let's keep it in front of us. So, listen, their wide receiving core, it's ridiculous. It really is. And they were putting guys in there. I had to look up, who is that? Uh, even after the great starters were, hey, they got tired. They ran so many routes. But a couple things, um, they're not running the football well. Because they throw it so much, their offensive line is not the same anyway, personnel-wise, and it's just not as tough as it used to be. You know, they don't line up and just try to maul you, and they're not going to be able to do that against the Giants. And Dak Prescott, great numbers and all that, but I don't know. I would say over the course of the first four games, I've seen as many as seven or eight balls that probably should have been intercepted. They've been fortunate. And Dak is not afraid. He's taking chances, being aggressive with the ball. So that's another opportunity there that, you know, hopefully the Giants, they get a chance. They'll make that catch and get the interception and, and give their team a chance to beat the Cowboys down there. But the offense, the skill of the quarterback, uh, the wide receivers, it is truly, it's really good. 
and I think the Giants, will, I would think, defensively play a lot like they did against the Rams with that kind of scheme and just make the Cowboys really work to drive the football down the field. Phil, it's interesting you brought up the Cowboys' offensive line because, as you noted, the personnel has certainly changed. And I think it's fair to say in previous years, we've always held the Cowboys' offensive line in high regard as one of the best units in the league, maybe the model. And now you see all the injuries, Lyle Collins, the right tackles out for the season. What specifically has jumped out to you about that unit as to why, to your point, the dynamics are very much different than what they were in previous years? Well, I think one is talent, uh, two, falling behind, but just the mentality. You know, there's many things that come with it. In other words, Ezekiel Elliott, is he the same running back I saw years ago? I, you know, I would say no, he's not. And, and now he's not getting the opportunities he did before where they just get that rhythm of overpowering you. That is not happening. And not only that, what it does just to your football team in general, now they're throwing the game, you know, their defense is back on the field because they're throwing the ball so much. It's three and out, or they score whatever it is. And when you run the football, there's something that comes with it that we're not seeing from the Cowboys, and that is toughness. When you line up and just run the ball, and there becomes a toughness, of course, with your offensive line. But, you know, your defensive line and defense has to practice against that during the week. And I know it's practice, but, you know, practice is competitive too. You know, you don't want the other guy on the other side beating your rear end in practice, so it toughens up the defense. So we're seeing this accumula- really go through their whole football team. And Mike McCarthy kind of got away from, you know, that power and everything that Green Bay might have had. They became a really quick, short passing team. And, you know, I'm not going to say it's, it's completely turned already down in Dallas, but I think it's something a big concern. And, and, and I would think this week playing against the Giants, they might be a little more conservative and see if they can get back to running the football hard and giving Ezekiel Elliott a chance to really get in the rhythm of the game and see if he's still the guy that we thought he was a couple years ago. Phil, closing question, high-scoring affair? Are the Giants finally going to get this offense going? We look at it first to 30. How do you, what do you think the feel and the flow of this game is going to be like? Man, listen, I, I never have a <laughs> – I'm going to – it's really hard. I think the Giants, the lower the score is, the greater chance they have of winning the football game. That's for sure. I don't think you want to get in a shootout with the Dallas Cowboys because two things, you get in a shootout, that means, you know, defensive linemen, I wrote that down as one of the things. Defensive linemen can only rush the passer so many times. So I think the Giants, if they could, if they can hold the Cowboys – if they can hold them in the low, mid to low 20s, if they keep them under 25, I think they'll have a good chance to win this game because I know they can pass protect against this defensive front. And listen, many mistakes in the secondary for the Cowboys. Uh, it, it's not overly talented, that's for sure. They have trouble at linebacker. So the Giants should be able to put up some touchdowns this week. And, and um, you know, I'm rooting for them, of course. I, I want them to beat the Dallas Cowboys. It'll be a, a great way to kind of get this thing going for Joe Judge, for Jason Garrett, and the whole football team. Phil, great stuff. We appreciate the time. Tremendous insight, and we'll enjoy your coverage of all the games on CBS on Sunday. Thank you. All right, guys. Thanks for having me on. That's the great Phil Simms, Super Bowl champion. Of course, you can find them on CBS covering the NFL on their pregame show. That, of course, the Sims Spotlight, presented by Bigelow T. T proudly. (laughs) 